Welcome, welcome, welcome. MSU Extension is so happy to see folks who may be interested in preserving food. This is the first of a series of three. Next month we will be talking about hot water bath canning. The month after that we'll be talking about pressure canning. So hopefully folks that so desire to will be able to preserve food at home. I'm Monica Smith. I'm your extension educator. The equivalent of, you remember Green Acres? The crazy guy? Yeah, that's me. Um, for food and nutrition here at Kent County. And I'm a registered dietitian. My master's degree is in counseling and I love food and I believe in nutrition as a way of, of having good health and happy times. This PowerPoint presentation is extremely wordy, but it came straight from the University of Georgia, who is our national food preservation. Um, they're, they're our center for national food preservation through the USDA. So I did eliminate a couple of these, but these pretty much are word for word. I'm just gonna try to give you the highlights, but when you download this from the website from Weebly, it will be intact in all of its glory and will give you more information than you probably ever wanted to know about freezing. How many of you think that freezing is easy? You just sort of freeze it and put it in the freezer. Well, I used to think that. I used to think that until I ruined a few things. Just want to remind you that uh, MSU Extension welcomes everyone in our community. We do not discriminate, nor do we um, hang out with people that do discriminate against anyone based on anything. We are here for our full community. So thank you for coming. Advantages of freezing. Almost everything can be frozen. There's a few things. Lettuce doesn't freeze, right? My refrigerator does. <laughs> in my refrigerator. If some of it freezes in the refrigerator, um, it can really maintain the good color. Some of the texture can be superior in a frozen product. Some texture is not superior in a frozen product. It depends on the higher moisture content, the less the texture will be. Foods can be frozen really quickly. That's a really good advantage. It's pretty simple, pretty convenient. My favorite reason though is proportions. You don't have to have a whole lot of anything to preserve it. As a backyard gardener, if I just have a few extra peppers, meaning six or eight, I can prepare them very quickly, put them in a Ziploc baggie and put them in the freezer. Do you think for one minute I'm going to get out that pressure canner, those jars, do all that work for six or eight peppers? No. I want a half bushel or more or something if I'm going to go to that trouble. So this is wonderful. You can do just a little bit and preserve it. Coming from the south where my mother and father chose to buy a lot in the city, a house to see that had an extra lot just so we could garden. And having canned many, many things in August in the South without air conditioning, I truly appreciate the kitchen staying somewhat cool and comfortable, okay? That's a big thing, especially when it's 80 degrees out. Disadvantages, the texture can be a disadvantagement. Investment and cost of maintaining a freezer. Utility bills are doing nothing but going up, right? Click, click, click. Do you hear the meter run? It is not cheese cheap to freeze things. It's not. Overall, you need to have proper storage containers. Those are not wholly inexpensive. Um, and your storage space is limited, right? You've got a finite amount of place in the freezer. But if you were my mother, you can stack jars of things and put them into furniture formations if necessary. Pickles can become a sofa <laughs> with a slip cover. Not true with freezing, all right? The main thing that people need to understand, that you need to understand about freezing, is if you want a high quality product, you gotta stop that enzyme action. Freezing stops it, it doesn't kill it. It halts it, it's like suspended animation, it stops it. To a point, to get the best possible product, you're going to have to do some prep with what you're freezing, with your fruits and vegetables, okay? If you don't blanch your vegetables before you freeze them, they are going to become colors that you may not like. There is a green, this color that asparagus becomes when you freeze it and you don't blanch it, that is unlike any green that you've ever seen. Most people would not find it appetizing. 
it's worth the time to blanch. Fruits, instead of blanching fruits, although you can steam fruits and stop it, most people prefer to use um, like an ascorbic acid type, an acid thing to set the, the enzyme in fruit. The more water, the more potential you have for ice crystals, the more potential that you have for a texture that you don't care for, okay? So, you always want to minimize that, you want to minimize that cell situation when you're freezing a fruit or a vegetable, which means you want to freeze it cold and you want to freeze it quick. That keeps the cell structure small. That's the best thing that you can do. Also, letting them get frozen as quick as possible. Here's a lesson I've learned. Five years ago, I went out and bought a new freezer. Was I happy? Did I want to fill it up right away? So I went on like this freezing extravaganza, right? Let's just freeze everything. Let's go to the farmer's market and take three friends with big trunks. Let's just do it, right? Let's get it done. Let's take a week off from work and do it. Well, guess what? Everything that hit the bottom of the freezer first, beautiful, froze beautiful. It was like eating fresh. Those poor things that were stuck in the middle, that became soup because it did not freeze as good. You do not want to overload your freezer when you're freezing. You want to work in smaller batches and get it frozen hard quickly. The longer it takes the food to freeze, the more texture change you're going to have. So even if you do have everybody at your house this weekend to do asparagus, you're probably not going to have as, it'll be better for you to prepare it, put a batch in the refrigerator, freeze a batch, then take the batch out of the refrigerator and then freeze that, and then take another batch out of the refrigerator and freeze that. Do you see what I'm saying? Going from cold to frozen is superior and letting it freeze before you add the next layer of frozen, to, to be frozen is best. This holding at zero degrees for best quality, this is another mistake I made. Being my mother's child, I like to save money. So that means I don't want that freezer to work any harder than it has to, right? So of course I put my thermometer in my freezer and thinking that I was gonna save money. Uh, you know, what is freezing? Freezing is 32 degrees, right? Oh, come on, zero? These people are overzealous. Doesn't need to be zero. 20 would be more than sufficient. It's 12 degrees below freezing. <laughs> Look at this, folks. Let this persuade you to crank the <coughs> freezer. If you were only freezing for three weeks, 20 is just fine. If you're wanting to freeze food today, this weekend, so that you can be the envy of everyone in your family at Christmas time when you pull out your asparagus, you really need it to be at least at five, but zero is better. And if you're gonna run the freezer, trust me, running the freezer at zero and at 20, you're not saving any money if you're throwing that food away. Likewise, a freezer holds its temperature better full. So if you don't have food to fill your new freezer, I would have done a lot better if I just filled up a bunch of empty milk cartons and put them in the freezer to take up space. And then as I wanted to fill my freezer, I could take those out, okay? Um, freezer it works better when it's full and it maintains its temperature better when it's full. So you should always keep it at zero? Keep it at zero. Always keep it at zero. Now there's types of freezers. Yes, ma'am. Before you continue, can you clarify if this is possible? Because I think freezer and I'm thinking the top of my brain. That's what I was just going to talk about. Types of freezers. Okay, continue. Chest freezer. Chest freezer is going to hold temperature the best, the longest, long term the best. However, getting to the stuff in the middle isn't easy. You have to be the king or queen of organization. You have to be willing to crawl in there if you want those peas, right? Then you have the upright freezer. Those are much more convenient to load, much more convenient to get out, but every time you open the door, you're really getting a blast. They don't hold zero as easily but they're still very effective. 
the ones you have in the top of your refrigerator are least effective. You're probably not going to be able to hold those at zero unless you're the kind of person that only opens it once a week. If you're opening it for ice, you're opening it for a frozen dinner, you're opening it for whatever reason, just to see what there is to see, because that's what we do. You're probably looking at a storage time in your refrigerator of a month. Um, that's probably what you're looking at. For optimal quality, now keeping in mind, once you put something in the freezer, it won't become unsafe. We're not talking about botulism, we're not talking about food safety questions. With freezing, we're talking about plain, pure quality. We're talking about delicious versus freezer burnt. We're talking about good texture versus mushy or crunchy. So once it's frozen, if it stays frozen, there's no safety issue involved. It's just, is it what I anticipated? Was it worth the work and money I put into it? Folks, here's another one. <laughs> I can speak to you from so many mistakes I have made with food <laughs> preservation. You know how at the farmer's market you can get the very best deal at the end of the day? Okay. So I go to the farmer's market at the very end of the day on Saturday. So they've already been there Friday and all day Saturday. And that's back when peppers were like 10 cents a piece. You know, they're just begging you to please take them. They're back, like throwing them at you as you go by because I'm going to chop them up and freeze them because you can add them to soup, stew, whatever. You want to use the best quality anything to freeze. If that pepper's been sitting out there all day or two days in the heat, not refrigerated, it's kind of shriveled up, and though it would have been perfectly okay if I'd gone home and I had either roasted it or chopped it up and put it in spaghetti sauce, it does not hold well in the freezer. This is not a way to improve quality. You're not gonna, uh, you're not gonna fool anybody. You have to use good quality. Um, and you need good containers. My mother's daughter again. Everything can be reused, right? My mother was born in the Depression. Yogurt containers, butter containers, everything can be reused. Not. Some things are made to freeze in and some things are not. There are freezer quality plastics and there are not freezer quality plastics. So before you save that yogurt container to put those very expensive and time consuming blueberries in, you might want to think, was this designed to be frozen in? If it wasn't, you really shouldn't. Use freezer quality materials, okay? Same way with bags. Ziploc baggies that you put a sandwich in, though they're a great size for chopped peppers, are not designed for freezer. Use freezer quality. Foods need to go into their freezer cold. So, when you're preparing fruit or vegetables, let's say I've got asparagus this weekend, I'm gonna freeze it, I've blanched it. I've taken it, I've hit it into boiling water for the number of minutes recommended. I take it out, I immediately get it into an ice water bath because if I don't, it will continue to cook. And it needs to stay in that ice water bath about the same amount of time as you spent blanching to cool it. Then you want to lay it out on towels and let it, pat it dry because you want it to be as dry and as cool as possible. I oftentimes will put it in the refrigerator before I freeze it and let it go into the the freezer very, very cold. You get a superior product. If you freeze in quantity, does anybody have a really big family that would need more than a quart? So sometimes you, a lot of people want to freeze in those gallon size bags. You want to make sure that they're flat and as cold as possible when going in because it takes a long time for a gallon size container to freeze solid to the center. So if you can freeze in quarts or smaller, you're, you're likely to have a better quality product. So you might have to use two or three for your family instead of one if you have a big family. Pack foods tightly, squish the air out, it's worth the time. Oxidation, air is what messes up our food when we preserve it. So you want to get as much of the air out as possible. There are a few exceptions, broccoli, um, tray packed, foods, I'll show you that in a minute. Uneven vegetables, they're not too affected. Other things really are affected. Somebody somewhere has done the research and that has proven that this is the best way to tie a bag off for freezing. 
I love that somebody figured that out. However, most of us in this day and age are using Ziplocs, right? Mm -hmm. um, what I do with Ziploc bags is I seal it, I flip it, and I tape it. I'm very, very, because if I've gone to all this work, I want it to be beautiful. It takes me two seconds more to flip and tape than just to count on the, the Ziploc mechanism. They failed before. Trapped foods or liquids in the sealing area will freeze, expand, and loosen the seal. This is really important. I put peaches up a few, maybe three years ago. I drove all the way to Pullman to get my peaches. I put some up in syrup because I was going to make peach pies with them at Christmas. And I did, when I'm in jars, I always think about headspace. But I didn't think about headspace in my bags. And so when it expanded, it challenged that seal and broke the seal on some of my bags. Hence, I now flip and tape and I pay attention to having room for expansion. Now, now, some of you in here are very young and I know you have good memories. But I promise you, things when they are frozen become really hard to identify. <laughs> and at the moment you put them in there, you know they're peaches. You don't need to write on them. That they're, You're going to remember this weekend. This is a weekend that is going to go down in history, the weekend you spent peeling peaches, right? No. And too much, you're going to look at that and go, peaches, carrots, what is that? What day did I do that? Did I do peaches more than once? Which ones do I need to eat first? Come on. It's the price of a Sharpie. Take the time. You're going to be, I'm speaking from experience. I've had many impromptu meals because what I thought out I thought was greens and in fact it was something else. Um, so you really want to do this. I don't go as far as to put the number of servings or amount. I know how much a quart will feed me. But I do write the date and what's in that bag. And I also write the, I write the date that I've, I'm putting it up and what's in the bag. If you're doing a larger quantity of food you can set your freezer at 10 below zero, and that will help it maintain at least zero. If you've got a new freezer, wish I had done this, or an empty freezer, set it at 10 below for the first 24 hours. Wish I had known that one, didn't know that one. We talked about not overloading the freezer. Here's another one, I've, I've made this mistake. Pack already frozen fruits, foods together. So you've got stuff in your freezer now. You take it, you stack it to one side, you put the newly, the things you want to freeze over to the right or over to the left so that you're not putting warm things on top of the colder things because any thawing causes that ice crystal to form. Um, you want to leave space around the packages so cold air can circulate and then when they're frozen, make them as tight as possible, okay? Now, those of you who are so inclined to keep a frozen foods inventory, I admire you. <laughs> it's a great idea to know what's in your freezer. And when you've taken it off, I've got 22 peaches, I've got 13 blueberries, I've got um, six pounds of ground beef, and now you take it and you cross it off. I admire you. I have never, ever been able to pull this off. So right now, even as we speak, I am frantically trying to eat up peaches because I need to empty my freezer. <laughs> I am frantically trying to eat up canned green beans because I need my jars. So you're gonna end up eating a whole lot of something if you don't keep this inventory. I do it every year. and This is the year I tell myself I'm gonna do an inventory. We will see. Well, that would keep you from opening your freezer and staring at what you have all the time too. Oh, yes, what have I got? Do I have to dig to the bottom? Do I have to get to the middle of the freezer to remember if I have any of this or that? No, because I've got the inventory taped to the top. I add it when I put it in. I scratch off. It's not complicated, is it? I cannot explain it. I have, I've been challenged in this area, but I've, I'm going to try to do it this year because what is in the middle, I have to eat all at once in June. Um, Making sure that you get, if there's anything left over from last year, get it up to the top so that you can get it eaten. Check your thermometer. 
Now a lot of you may have new freezers and they have a little thing built in, maybe a gauge built in or a dial or they may even have their own thermometer. I do not trust it. I put a standard thermometer in my freezer. I need to know that that's at zero. No matter what the temperature is outside, I need to know that that's good. I want to make sure that what I've put all that money into in time stays good. And I have found variances in what my freezer tells me um, and what my th thermometer tells me. Optimal. Fruits have to be perfect to freeze. Really beautiful. Um, overripe or immature, they, get, they only get worse when you freeze them. They're not good. You have to work with small amounts of fruit at a time because you've got to treat them with the sorbic acid before you get them into, and the longer they set, the better your chance for browning. So you have to work with small amounts at a time. So in other words, if you go to the farmer's market, you buy a bushel of peaches. You don't peel all of the peaches and then slice all of the peaches and then bag all of the peaches. You would want to peel, slice, treat, bag. Then move on to your next batch. Um, set up it sort of like an assembly line. You have to heat, heat it too? Not with fruits. You can, but you don't have to. Okay. You can heat fruits, and that works pretty good if you're going to use it for pies or you're going to cook them. Um, but I usually just use ascorbic acid. And you can use ascorbic acid. You can use fruit fresh or standard ascorbic acid. And this gives you the amount to use, but I always check what's on the package because different manufacturers do things differently. A lot of people want to use lemon juice. If you use lemon juice, your product is going to taste differently. And every lemon does not have the same acidity level. So you could have one batch that looks beautiful and the next batch that turns brown. Salt and vinegar. Interesting, huh? Okay, I don't um, know what the sorbic acid is. You just dip it in you, like, you make a water you solution. Blueberries, and just let them sit there. blueberries you don't have to do. We're talking about peaches, pears apples, berries you don't have to treat. Berries you don't have to treat, but your peaches, your pears, your apples, um, if you're doing nectarines, all of those you have to treat. And what you do is you have, uh, I set up an assembly line. I have a bowl here, and this is where my peelings are going. I'm peeling, peeling, peeling. Then I take my whole fruit and I plunk it into the solution of water and fruit fresh. It stays in there until I've gotten enough to do three bags. Then I take it out, I slice it. That sliced fruit into the next patch of water and um, fruit fresh. Now when I've gotten enough and I'm going to bag it, now I take them out, I drain them really good in my colander, then I bag them. So this is just a way of holding so that you don't turn around because if air hits it, oxid oxidization happens. So. You really want to do this. I've tried lemon juice. I've tried sugar syrup. I've, tried, I've never tried salt and vinegar. Um, I've tried citric acid. Nothing works as good as the commercial uh, mixtures. If you are packaging, freezing your fruit, you can freeze it individually. It's called tray pack, right? Maybe you want to slice your peaches, put them on a tray, put them in the freezer. When they freeze solid, then you want to take them out and put them into baggies, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to do that, that lets you have individual pieces of peaches. Then you can just take them out and put them on your cereal if you want. If you just want to eat a few, you can. However, if you're my mother and you're from the South, you want syrup pack. <laughs> Maximum sugar. That's more like what you would get in the can at the store, right? It's in a syrup solution. When you, fr when you freeze in a syrup solution, you get a beautiful end product. The cell wall is beautiful and syrup pack, beautiful. However, you also get the added sugar. And when you thaw it, it thaws in a big brick, right? Yes. If I have a quart in syrup pack, I need to be prepared to eat a quart. I can't just reach in the freezer and get three pieces if I want it. You can use Ascorbic acid, if you're just using sugar by just sprinkling it over the fruit with sugar, but it always works best if you use a little bit of water with it. There is a sprinkle method. I don't recommend it. I've gotten spotty results every time I've done that. Does anybody going to do pureed fruit purees or fruit juices to freeze? Grape, uh, maybe. You could do grape, it's nice. Grape. 
Yes, if you do them, you make you have to use the ascorbic acid in the prepared fruit. Now, here's a, here's a, I'll go back and say, if you've got something that's slightly overripe, peaches. This is a way that you can use a slightly overripe peaches if you do it in a puree and freeze it. And then you could take it out when it's frozen hard. You can use a uh, scoop, like ice cream scoop, right into a, a smoothie. And you can use slightly overripe fruit for that. Now, I'm not talking about last month's fruit, people. I'm talking about slightly overripe fruit. You can extend, extend it by doing a puree. Um, and I, I sometimes do purees if I've got a little bit of this, that, and the other, and I make a mixed fruit puree, mm -hmm. you know, um, and they're really tasty. And then they can also turn into, you can put them on the stove and cook that puree, and then you can have a nice syrup for ice cream or for meats. Yes, ma'am. You absolutely can, but keep in mind if you're doing, now this is for fruit, if you were doing vegetables, you'd have to blanch them. But yes, you do this and you've got baby food. And believe me, no commercial baby food people want you to know how easy this is. Now if you did this, can you put them in like um, ice trays? You could put them in ice trays, but then you need to get them into a bag as soon as though. Don't put them in the ice tray and forget about them for a week. Put them in the ice tray and then when they freeze solid, Get them into um, freezer type baggies or rigid containers. And then you've got a, about a one ounce serving of anything that's put in an ice cube tray. It's about one ounce. So this is instead of, you don't have to soak the peaches in the water bath first. You you're going to still have to soak them in the water bath because you're going to have to peel them. With the absorbic acid and then you also add it. You're, because if you don't, if you're taking all the time to peel it uh -huh. and you set it on the counter, by the time you get enough peeled and pureed, you're going to have browning starting. So you're still going to have to do it in the beginning for just, but then when you slice it, you put it in the blender, puree it, you add it to that, then you're done. Okay. But anytime you're peeling something that turns brown, you want to have, you want to have that acid solution to hold them in. Okay. I've never seen anybody steam fruit before freezing. But I hear a lot of people do it. Some of the older folk do it because they're going to cook all the fruit. Like my grandmother made cooked apples all the time. She made cooked peaches. Stewed fruit, has anybody heard that? Stewed fruit used to be big. Nobody eats stewed fruit anymore. But you can steam and avoid the ascorbic acid. Maybe if you had a sensitivity to it or needed a very low acid diet, this might be helpful to you. But steamed fruit is not very good eaten straight from the freezer. Um, it really wants to be cooked. Um, syrup pack always gives you a better texture. It's not safer one way or the other. It's not any safer. Here's another mistake I made. Do you see that peach right there? Poking its little head up above the syrup, mm -hmm. that peach will be brown and slimy and icky. Okay? You have to put crumpled water-resistant paper in the top of it so that it will push it down. So a little ball of wax paper over the top. I think they showed that. See? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm telling you, folks, it's so worth the one second it takes to crumble that if you don't want to be scraping off a layer of icky peach. <laughs> sugar pack, um, you can do in syrup. You can just put sugar on the pan. You can just put sugar in the bowl. But you don't have to add any sugar to freeze. Non-nutritive sweeteners. People want it maybe sweeter than the product and you want to use like Splenda or a NutraSweet, one of those things. I really recommend doing that at the table. They can be different when you thaw them out than when you put them in. If you want to use a non-nutritive sweetener, I wouldn't do it in the process. Dry pack is great for berries, mm -hmm. just great. All you do is you put the fruit, you cut it up. Well, berries don't even have to cut up unless they're huge strawberries. Berries, you lay them out on a tray, you put them in the freezer, they freeze hard, you add them to your bags, all there is to it. Do not wash blueberries before you freeze them or you will have ice, little ice balls. You want to wash them before you use them. Wash them before you use them. It helps thaw them out too. You can just about thaw a blueberry by rinsing it well. I always wash my blueberry when I towel. Yeah. If you wash them, you have to dry them really good because they just soak up so much moisture. So you don't need to wash berries. Okay. Strawberries? 
Strawberries. Strawberries will hold up better to the washing because they have a really hard, if you wash them, then haul them, that will hold up pretty good. A blueberry, because it's already open on the top, will absorb. Raspberries just turn into little sponges. Yeah. I made that mistake mm -hmm. once. Mm -hmm. No good if you wash them before freezing them, you know. See, that's how they look. Nice tray into the freezer, then they took them out. The, the beauty of these kind of containers is they stack really nice. And they're also eco-friendly, right? You reuse them. Now, somebody asked me just the other day, I've been taking my frozen things out of the freezer for my freezer bags and rinsing them. Can I reuse my freezer bags? If they were a very high quality freezer bag and there are no punctures in it, you can dry them and reuse them. But again, be careful about trusting that Ziploc thing at the top. If you're reusing one, I would surely flip it over and tape it. I would not trust that freezer seal for a second season. Oh yes, the shape remains nice for these two. So this is great for a salad, a fruit salad of sorts. Whereas if you, if you freeze in juice, they're gonna come out and they're gonna be different shapes, sizes. Um, okay for a pie, but not so much to put out on a plate. They're saying the same thing. This doesn't help. Non-nutritive sweeteners don't help with texture. They don't help with color retention. Really better to add them right before serving. Vegetables, young, tender. Zucchinis that are this big are not young, nor are they tender. Little zucchinis, little squash, young green beans, best possible quality. Wash small amounts at a time and don't soak. If you soak, you're back in the same situation again. They're just taking up water. Blanching is the best way to set the enzyme. It's also the best way to get rid of any microorganisms, best way. Don't under blanch. On the internet, under food preservation, there's a guide that I've put there for you to download that will tell you how long that you blanch any vegetable that you want to freeze. Because green beans are different from corn, which is different than peas, okay? Anybody have one of these commonly known as the pasta pot? Mm -hmm. These are great for blanching, really quick, wonderful. Um, water has to be boiling when the vegetables hit it, and then your time starts from the time the water begins to boil again. So for best quality, don't overpack that basket, because if that basket is packed to the hilt, when it hits, it's not gonna maintain the boil. It's better to do a little at a time, dip and move, dip and move. You can also steam blanch, but it takes so long. It takes a lot of energy. It heats up your kitchen. It's just easier for me just to dunk them in the water. But you can, you can, but look how few beets that you can do at a time. You could do three times that many if you were dunking. immediately cool them. Another mistake. Blanch. I just thought uh, ice is expensive, right? So I was just going to run them under cold water, you know, and then put them in the bag. No. It's worth investing in ice to dip them in ice water. It really is. A way that you could save money doing this is um, clean a milk container very, very well inside and outside, freeze that solid. Then in your, uh, I use a great big bucket, which I have cleaned and sterilized, and I just put that milk container in there with the water. So I have to keep dumping ice buckets in there. It's like a big frozen cube, and that keeps the water nice and cold. And when the milk thing starts to um, thaw out, I put another one in. It's a lot better than buying ice. Vegetables can also be dry packed, but I don't see the need for it. When do you ever reach in there and want three green beans? Now maybe if you make pizzas and you just want five zucchini slices, 
But as a general rule, I don't dry pack them. I put them right into the bags and get them into the freezer. I don't go to all the trouble to lay them out on trays and freeze them and then repack them. That would be like um, I'm thinking of green pepper. Maybe for green pepper where you want to just be able to get a few. But if you put them in a bag and you flatten the bag, I just take the whole bag out and I just chop them into fourths and I've got a green pepper chunk. Gotcha. That's good. That way it saves me from having to, to tray freeze. But yeah, with green pepper, onions, those things are kind of nice to be able to get into. And they should be washed before? Yes. Anything that blanched needs to be washed before it's blanched. Don't think, oh, I'm going to dip this in here and kill all the stuff on it so I don't need to wash it. Wash everything first. Everything first. And again, with, with veggies, just like fruit, get the air out as quick as you can, as much as you can. If you thaw fruit completely, it won't be as good when you serve it as if you leave it just the tiniest bit frozen. Just the tiniest bit. Um, sugar thaws faster because of osmolality. Sugar thaws faster than a dry pack. So you'll have to experiment. Likewise, if you have a, even though it's in a big cube, you may find that those peaches that you did in sugar thaw out a lot quicker than the ones that you put um, in a dry pack bag if you're looking for the whole bag. But you can always put them in the microwave for a couple seconds. Cook without thawing your vegetables. Here's the exception to that rule. Let's say you froze some mixed vegetable bags. Let's say you froze, I don't know, green beans, carrots, and corn together. Because, you know, they have those blends at the store all the time that we pay big bucks for. If you want to put that into a slow cooker for stew or soup, it needs to be thawed. You don't put things in the slow cooker frozen because it will not come to temperature quick enough and you're setting yourself up for foodborne illness. Now if you're going to take that same bag, if you're going to take that same bag and put it in stoop or sue on the stove, it's no big deal. Just the slow cooker. Anybody going to do greens? Mustard greens, collard greens, turnip greens? Me too. Yum. Oh. Um, a little bit thawed they work better because if you put them in a solid cube, the ends tend to disintegrate if you put them completely um, frozen into the pot. I do not want to neglect to tell you about this. How many power outs did we have last year? I live over in Fairmount Square near East Town and Wealthy. You know, all those new restaurants have gone in and condos and there's a lot of people drawing electricity now oh my goodness did we have the power outs last year so resist the urge to open the freezer door resist it um, the more full your freezer the better off you're going to be full freezer now they're talking about a chest freezer keeps two to four days. An upright, maybe two to three days if you don't open it. Half full, only a day. This again makes the case for a lot of frozen milk jugs to keep your freezer full in case you have a power out. Dry ice, if you know the free, if, if the power company says you're out of luck for the next two days, dry ice. The one place that I know that sells dry ice or used to, I don't know if they still do, is on the corner of College and Leonard. There's a party store there that used to sell dry ice, but they have under new management. They no longer sell ice cream. Myers does. Meyer sells dry ice. Worth your time if they tell you it's going to be out uh, more than one to two days. Don't touch that stuff. It'll take your skin. Mm -hmm. And don't put the dry ice on top of your frozen baggies or you know what will happen? Your baggies will break. You won't be able to peel it off the baggies. Mm -hmm. So you want to put a cardboard, piece of cardboard down that you put the dry ice on because anything it touches it sticks to. Now, let's say some of the things in your freezer during this power out 
thaw somewhat. They still have some ice crystals. They're still partially frozen. You can refreeze those. It won't be a problem. It's not unsafe. Quality will be different. So then you're looking maybe at a stew or a casserole or a soup to use with those things. If you open that freezer and things are completely thawed, <laughs> cook like crazy if you know it has only been two hours or less. But if those things have been completely thawed for more than two hours, I'm sorry to tell you, you need to throw it away. So, again, it's probably worth the trip to get dry ice. Once you've hit that 24 hour mark, once I hit, I, I'm, I'm, at, I'm going for dry ice at 24 hours. I'm not waiting to see if it comes back on because I don't want to lose everything I've got. Here's this disclaimer, isn't that incredible? But what it really says is, trust us. <laughs> What questions can I answer for you about freezing? There's very few things you need to remember. Put it in the freezer cold. Have your freezer cold enough. Fill your freezer. Stop enzyme action. That's really what it comes down to. Keep foods that you're packing in syrup under the syrup. Um, use good quality bags and freezer containers. Don't chance on what you freeze in. A lot of people will freeze in foil or paper. I've never had good luck with that. But any source that you look at will tell you that it's all right to do it. It's safe. For me, I want premium, premium quality for that amount of work. Has anybody ever frozen tomatoes? You can freeze tomatoes. The lower um, liquidy kind, the ones that don't have as much moisture, are better like Romas will freeze really nice. A real juicy beef steak, not so much. But you can freeze tomatoes. Like last year, remember when the tomato blight hit mm -hmm. and everybody was discouraged because they couldn't um, mm -hmm. can their tomatoes? I was telling people left and right the phone, freeze them, freeze them, freeze them. Make sauce out of them or freeze them, just freeze them. You don't have to lose all your tomatoes. You simply can't can them because the pH changes in a blighted vine. It depends on how you want to do them. Personally, what I do is I blanch them, peel them, slice them in half, and put them in the freezer. Oh, yeah, you blanch them? Because I want the skins off. Okay. I don't want to freeze any tomatoes with skins on. Because then once they come out, skins are tough. So I blanch them just long enough for the skins to pop, which takes a minute. I peel the skins, cut them in half, and freeze them. Somewhere where we can find like a list of how to do each type of fruit. I mean, like yes. how to freeze corn, how to freeze. Yes, corn. on our website www.kentnutrition, all one word. Dot Weebly. W e e b l y. Dot com. Click on the food preservation tab, and there's going to be a long list of resources. Everything from you can figure the cost of your food preservation. There's a canning guide, there's a freezing guide, and it will tell you the exact process you need to go through for whatever fruit or vegetable, how long to blanch, how much um, ascorbic acid to use. You'll have everything that you want to know. I, with the zucchini, I mean, it's, it seems to have a lot of moisture in it. I mean, do you slice it? Do you keep it whole? It depends on what you want to do with it, what you're going to do with it in the end. I slice it and I slice it into big chunks okay. to freeze. Sometimes I even grate it oh. to freeze because then it can go into, uh, uh, you know, mystery things where you really don't want people to know you're feeding them zucchini, but you want to extend the recipe to feed more people or to pack a little vegetable in there. I like grated zucchini and banana bread. I like it in, in different pumpkin bread. I like it um, on pizza. So I sometimes grate some. And you can also make, uh, like hash browns only with zucchini. Yeah. You can just do, you can freeze them, shredded, take them out, slightly thaw them, add a little Italian seasoning and fry them up and they're great. Low carbon, delicious. Mm -hmm. That's the zucchini? Mm -hmm. You shred it like Yes, I shred it like potato. Okay. 
And so you do that when it's not cooked, right? You just you're doing it. Okay. You're I'm doing it when it's not cooked. Now, let me tell you what. Blanching time for that uh-huh. is but a second. Okay. It's in and out. So you sh- you cut it up like you sh- you shred it and then blanch it and then dry it. And, and it's in and out blanch. Okay. Hit the water out and into cold water because there's all that surface area. It only needs to hit the water for literally 10, 10 seconds, maybe. Okay. It's quick. So you leave the skin on. I leave the skin on. Mm-hmm. And, and I know for my food, we need bread recipe. It calls for like two cups of zucchini, mm-hmm. so I shred it up, just stick it in the freezer, and then two cups of milk. So then when I know I'm going to use the zucchini, then mm-hmm. I just stick it out of the freezer. It'll be really liquidy, but I just stick it all in the recipe. Turn it off. And if you don't do that for long, it won't turn brown. If you leave it in there for six months, you're going to have funky-looking zucchini. But it would not hurt her recipe to have funky-looking zucchini. It would still be safe, and she's putting it in the recipe. Nobody's going to see it. Yeah, mine's in the freezer for almost a year, and it's still fine. Yeah. My husband um, blanched some broccoli, and it just tasted funky afterwards. Is that, I mean, because he kept it in the water too long, do you think? Or? He could have kept it in the water too long. The broccoli could have been overripe if you grew it. Cruciferous vegetables can get more and more and more powerful. Yeah, it's just a weird, weird flavor, but it, you know, yeah. Um, it could have been your water. Okay. Um, if you have well water, if you have water additives, that can change things. Cruciferous vegetables can also interact with your pots and pans. Okay. So it could also be if you have aluminum pots and pans, it could be that. Okay. So you want to look at the kind of pot or pan that you're using, especially if you have water additives. Um, It's very hard to control it. Yeah. My understanding that blanching for any vegetable is literally you dunk it in and take it out. No. It to when it gets to the boil again. It, on that guide, it'll tell you how long that you need to blanch. Okay. So some you need blanch longer, some you blanch shorter amount of time. Okay. And that would be on this Kent Nutrition Weekly? Mm-hmm, on the food preservation tab. I've, I downloaded a USDA guide to fruit and vegetable preservation that you can download. If you, are, if you are new to food preservation, this is the place to start. This is the place to build your confidence. The next place to go would be hot water bath canning, then the next place to go would be pressure canning. So that's the journey. That's the, also drying is also very easy to do, but requires, uh, it can require significant equipment um, investment. I'm just curious on the website, you know it's the preservation of herbs as well? Under drying. So drying. You can freeze them, but you're drying, you're probably going to get a lot better. Okay. Now, what you can do is dry them and then freeze them, and they will stay perfect indefinitely. Okay. They will stay perfect indefinitely because they won't have to fight light. They won't have to fight heat. They'll be beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay. So asparagus would be on this site. Yes. Sometimes mine is so watery and sometimes it's not. My guess is either A, you don't want to get asparagus that is overripe, so you have to be sure that you start out with a nice, firm, just mature asparagus that it's not been blanched too long and that it's very cold when it goes into the freezer. So make sure that they... put it in the cold bath, doesn't that deteriorate? Doesn't that... You must hit that cold water bath. You must. That's what I miss. Because if you don't, it still cooks and that makes the ice crystal bigger if it goes in there with any heat at all into it. It must hit the hot water, I mean the ice bath. And if you really want superior, put it in the refrigerator for a couple hours before you get into the freezer. So like with the zucchini is the one I always have problems with, but by blanching it and, and, and then ice water, then it would help it from being so mushy. But keeping in mind, zucchini is a high water vegetable. It's not going to be crisp ever. There's nothing you can do to get a crisp zucchini out of the freezer. It is going to be soft. And so think about how you're going to use it accordingly. It's not going to go good in a crock pot. It's not going to stand up to all that cooking in a crock pot. It'll stand up pretty good. Um, for a last addition into a soup or stew, meaning you put it in the last 30 minutes, okay. the last 15 minutes, but you're never going to get a crisp one out, and you're never going to be able to grill one successfully that you've frozen. Mm-hmm. It's just not going to work. Any other questions? Who is actually planning to freeze this year? Who's growing their own to freeze? Is anybody growing their own to freeze? Cool. Cool. Great. I can't wait to hear your stories. 
buy the wax paper, okay? <laughs> Good luck and thanks for coming.